Dr. Michael Fender is uh, representing Germany, and uh, his presentation today will be on the topic of what are emissions from refinery sites. Thank you. All right. Um, I work with uh, the company Müller BBM in Germany for more than 20 years and we did, did some work on refinery odors and my presentation I'd like to give you a little insight um, in, the, in our work concerning the odor emissions from refineries. Um, here's the outline of my presentation. Um, I'd like to give some words about the aim of work and the methodology used. And then I'd uh, like to present you th uh, the results of three case studies. A kerosene tank farm, um, then other emissions from a, a retention pond, uh, it, which was used um, for the uh, intermediate storage of slightly contaminated uh, mineral oil sewage. And uh, the last case study, an investigation about an unexpected other incident that occurred during, during a refinery turnaround. Now, what is the aim of work? Um, refinery sites often have an is a, a history that reaches back to the early uh, 20th century and therefore they are often located very close to housing compounds. You can see, see this here, uh, for example, at the um, uh, Torrance Refinery in California, where you can see that there's a very dense populated area just Across, just across the street from the refinery side. And now today the standards of air quality have uh, improved and so people get more and more sensitive. And this means that uh, the refinery operators often have to, often have to deal with complaints about uh, all the noises from the, from the neighborhood. The operators want to act, they want to improve the situation, but now the challenge is how to use the money in the right way. Uh, there's no use, for example, to spend a lot of money uh, in any abatement measures, for example, uh, the, the um, expensive sealing system for a, for a tank. If it turns out that the real um, source of order wasn't this tank, but the tank, uh, but, another, but another source of order. And so um, this is where our work um, begins. We want to find out um, which are the really relevant sources, source, uh, source sources that uh, really cause the uh, the other perceptions in the in the uh, um, areas of the concern. To do this, we follow a stepwise approach. First, we have a very close look at the uh, processes and apparatuses, and then in this stage, it's also it's very important to talk to the experts on site because these people are those who, who know, have the, the most, the best information, the best knowledge about the plant. And in the second step, we try to um, calculate or estimate est uh, emission rates of the sources. We do this by uh, evaluating the information we gathered in the, uh, in the first step. And of course, in this, uh, in this, uh, at this point, um, um, we also use olfactorial measurement. Uh, to um, to characterize the the the, um, the 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 odors of mineral oil products uh, of those products who are involved in the processes we, we analyzed, and finally, the last step, if we have once established a proper um, emission rate emission rates, then we uh, uh, we process dispersion calculations um, to see if the the, uh, the source under concern really is. Uh, is the source that uh, causes uh, other perceptions in the neighborhood. And for this, we use a Lagrangian dispersion model. Uh, the use of the Lagrangian model is uh, mandatory in Germany. If, any, uh, if we follow any uh, official procedure or if any uh, official authority is involved, we have to use this model. But um, on the other hand, it, there is also a very interesting feature of this model. Uh, it is based on um, on meteorological uh, time series, uh, and these uh, meteorological time series are available in an hourly resolution, and the model also can incorporate emission rate time series, 
which means we can um, incorporate in the model very realistic emission scenarios, and that's what we do. So uh, here you can see, um, in this picture you can see uh, the, the uh, olfactory testing in the laboratory. I think we have, we have seen similar pictures yesterday that I can skip and for but this audience, I can skip any, any further explanations of the procedure. And so I'd like to proceed um, to the case studies. Let's begin with the case study one. Um, a tank farm operator decided to increase the turnover of kerosene uh, of this tank farm um, about 50%. Uh, this tank farm consisted of, or consists of um, for fixed roof tanks for the storage of kerosene. Um, and the special situation in this case is that um, the tank farm uh, is uh, located directly um, beneath a, um, an office building. There's an office building just across the street and uh, approximately 35 meters distance. And moreover, uh, the, the upper floor windows of this office building, they're just facing the tanks on the other side and the um, Retention, pressure retention valves of the tanks just uh, um, are facing directly the, uh, the, the building. And so we were asked uh, to deliver an expert opinion um, to, to, um, to forecast, to predict the, the odor impact um, of these tanks. Now, how to develop an emission rate time series for this problem? Uh, the kerosene is stored in um, fixed roof tanks, and the emissions of fixed roof tanks can be they are um, emission of fixed roof tanks are caused by two processes. One is loading, and the other is respiration. Loading is very easy. The exhaust volume is just equal to the um, to the, the, the to the, the, the liquid volume that's um, loaded into the tank. Um, and respiration, uh, exhaust, uh, exhaust volume caused by respiration uh, is it's caused by pressure alterations due to temperature alterations. Um, now, don't worry about these equations. I just put them here to give give uh, the representation a bit more scientific touch. It's essentially nothing nothing else but the ideal gas law. But what I'm driving at is the fact that both the filling level and the storage temperature of, uh, of a tank is usually available as measured data in very good resolution. And this means we can easily calculate uh, emission rate time, seri uh, time series of the exhaust volume um, by just using simple, uh, simple uh, mathematics or simple physics. Uh, what we additionally need, of course, is the order concentration of the exhaust volume. And in, no. in this case, uh, we did this by direct measurement. We took some field samples directly from the pressure retention valves of the, uh, of the tanks. And we also um, uh, prepared some laboratory samples, just as headspace samples uh, from, from liquid, uh, from, from kerosene samples. And what we, what we got is, um, what we see here on the picture on the left-hand side. Um, of course, uh, it's not very surprising. The order concentration uh, we found uh, is, uh, depends on the, on the storage temperature, and we use uh, the temperature dependency as indicated in this red line to calculate the emission rate time series, which you can see here on the right side. And um, as you can see, the, the emissions from loading and from respiration are clearly distingu distinguishable. That's because of the higher turnover rate of these tanks. So much for the emission, the emission rate estimation. And now for the uh, results of the dispersion calculations, which you can see here on the left-hand left side. Um, the map shows the um, auto perception frequency, the predicted auto perception frequency surrounding the tank. And it can be seen uh, that um, here uh, on, the, um, on, the, on the area under concern uh, and the 
front side of the office building, uh, the, the uh, predicted uh, percep um, perception frequency was more than 10%, and 10, uh, this is not acceptable under local German standards. Um, on the picture here on the bottom, on the right side, you can see uh, the predicted other perception frequency as a, fu as a function of the, um, of the overall uh, emission rate. And you can see from this picture that at least a 90% um, abatement, 90% uh, uh, emission reduction must be achieved by abatement measures to reach an acceptable level of other perception. Um, and this is a useful information, for example, uh, if, um, uh, if uh, in, in the case on the study, uh, it was intended to uh, apply internal floating roofs to the tanks. And um, now this information, I think, was very useful to formulate the uh, specification for the request of um, proposal for this, uh, uh, for this measure. All right. So much for the first case study. The next. Uh, this is about a retention area in a refinery, which uh, originally was provided for the installation of a storage tank, but the, st the tank was never erected. So this retention pond was free, and um, the operators decided to or wanted to use this retention area as a um, intermediate storage room, storage pond for slightly contaminated wastewaters, which were not um, did not meet the criteria for discharging and needed to be reprocessed. And the question did arise if uh, this might cause other nuisances in a about 350 meters uh, far housing compound. And Again, for this problem, we were asked for, for an expert opinion um, to, to give a forecast of the other perception caused by this retention pond. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a picture from the, the, from the olfactory alpha, alpha alpha sampling. Um, we have seen, uh, also we have seen such uh, similar pictures yesterday, so I think I can, can skip the technical um, uh, explanations of this and show you the results. And we found out a um, quite interesting thing. Um, this sampling was done on a warm summer day, and we started in a chilly morning and it ended somewhere in the, uh, in the afternoon. And we found, what we found out was that the samples from the we, we took in the early morning, in the chilly morning, uh, they showed. Uh, um, significantly less uh, other concentration than the samples of uh, we, we collected in the midday heat, which is not surprising, of course. And we, we thought it would be appropriate to incorporate this in the emission model. And um, from the measurement data and the, uh, the, the temperature data, which the temperature changes seasonally and it changes from day to night, but those data are available. And we incorporated all this in the model and what you see here on the left is the emission rate time series we used for this, for the description of this problem. And on the right side, no, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> and on the right side, here you can see the results of the dispersion calculation. And again, it turned out that in the, in the area under concern, um, the, uh, the forecast of other perception frequency was about 10%, um, which means that we could not recommend to the operator uh, that uh, this, uh, that this, uh, this, uh, this retention pond could be used as a, as a, um, as a permanent uh, storage. So let's get to the last. Um, case study. It's about an other incident, a singular other incident that uh, occurred during a refinery inspection, what had happened. Um, in the early morning, uh, a other perception uh, took place, uh, the, the, um, uh, the um, 
All this were observed um, in, this, uh, in, in, in the region around this uh, refinery. It was described as very strong, as typical mineral oil-like, and it lasted about six to eight hours, this event. And uh, it could be, um, and, and it, it seemed that this, um, this odor, this odor plume was moving along a line that led back to the refinery site. On the other hand, uh, the, um, the refinery is uh, 20, about 25 kilometers apart from this, uh, from, this, um, from this event, but yet it was uh, suspected that the refinery was responsible for that. And so again, we were, used, we were asked for an expert opinion um, on, on this, on this uh, issue. Um, first, we found out that there indeed did no, no, no real activity took place at the refinery. The only suspicious activity was a steam cleaning of apparatuses. And uh, the, use, the steam which was used for that was disposed by flaring. Um, this was more or less the only information we had, um, and we, uh, we, we, it was, we could not really describe this process, um, by, uh, not really give a, uh, give a, give a, not really could calculate the emissions, but we can good, uh, have a rough estimate, which seems to be plausible, and this was that um, an emission rate, we assumed the emission rate of uh, 1 billion odd units per hour, and uh, Process this, uh, use this as input for the uh, for dispersion calculation. But additionally, even if the uh, refinery was shut down, there are still the tanks operating, the storage tanks, and we had to account for the emissions from the from the storage tanks. And we thought it um, reasonable to to also account for the background emissions from the crude oil storage. Um, for time reason, now I like to skip. Um, the details about the, the estimation or calculation of um, of the uh, of the crude oil, of the, of the uh, emissions of the crude oil tanks, but just let me draw you your attention to this table, where um, uh, this this table shows um, the uh, other concentrations measured in the headspace of crude oil samples. Um, first of all, I must uh, Give you a correction here. Yeah, they is given other units per cubic meter, um, and the correlation factor in other units per kilogram hydrocarbons. But this is wrong. Uh, really meant is a million other units per cubic meter. And what you can see is first there are uh, crude oil brands that are strongly odorous. We measured in that space up to nearly 100 million uh, other units per cubic meter. Uh, the second thing is, uh, this is not true for all types of crude oil. Typically, Russian and Arabic um, crude oils are very strongly odorous, uh, whereas on the other side, um, oils from the Northern Sea, they are not very odorous. And the third fact, of course, we can see it is, again, the temperature temp uh, dependency. We incorporated all this in, in our, in our uh, emission model and used actual uh, real, uh, the, the real uh, measured uh, meteorological data from the time of this event, and what we found out um, was, were, uh, uh, um, uh, what the results were um, uh, GLC maps, other GLC maps like that. And what we can see here, what you see here on this picture is the one hour average of one selected hour of this, this event. Um, we see that indeed it is possible that the, the odor propagates along this long way, about 25 kilometers. Um, and it, under certain uh, meteorological conditions, it is possible that uh, odors travel that far. Of course, this is, this is not a proof of a real, um, that there was a real connection uh, of the incident and the refinery activity, because um, this was a... Uh, um, uh, because of the rough estimate I told you, but it is possible. That's that's what we could prove. And yes, just let me draw your attention to, to another thing, an interesting thing we see here. We see here that the the propagation plume divides in two lines, and that's because uh, the uh, the emission 
caused by flaring is about um, released in, six, in about 70 meters height, whereas the um, emissions from storage are in fact released at more or less ground level. And we know that the, um, the, 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 the wind direction shifts with the shifts in higher atmospheric layer, layers, and this you can see by that. So this is the end of my presentation. But nothing complete, and what I want to show you also is the the old. What I want to show also now is the complete um, for the out for the eight hour simulation. But now, now this is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Right, very interesting presentation, uh, and it looks like you're going to um, a great deal of additional calculations to refine yes. and have yes. variable emission rates. Yes. Um, do you find that you get a better correlation between predicted and observed by doing that? Um, we we did not uh, did not make this comparison. It was uh, only for the prediction. Um, of uh, potential uh, other events, it is just a planning tool. But we did no, we did no, uh, compare, uh, we did not compare measured with uh, calculated data. No, no, not not. Uh, it is recommended. But this this is no. This was not. Um, it's not done in, uh, in in legal procedures. This is just um, planning work, just for planning work. Any questions for Dr. Ben? You, um, in, uh, you had a graph with your emission. Uh, you had samples uh, from lab work and samples from the field. Um, can you explain how, what is the difference? What are the field samples and the lab samples? Yes, just a minute. Um, the the field samples they were uh, some uh, really on site from from the tank vapor space. We just um, took this from the pressure retention valves, and the laboratory samples were uh, prepared from. Headspace, the headspace from kerosene samples. And as you can see, they're in fact. Uh, no, it was just uh, the same product. Um, in fact, I think you're, you're driving at the fact that there is a difference between laboratory and field sampling. Yeah. And I think this is due to the fact that we do not reach chemical equilibrium, thermodynamic equilibrium in the in the real tank vapor space. And here we are closer to chem, to thermodynamic equilibrium. So this may be an overestimate, but um, at least as a conservative approach, I think it's reasonable to use. This. We, we use both. This, this coloration is, uh, involves all, all results. You took the uh, approach of odor. Uh, this is a refinery, hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you value measuring all the odor and predicting it, measure at the same time all the hydrocarbons on the tray, and the same thing to see what happens? Um, yes, we, we we did we do did some um, measurement of the uh, the sum of hydrocarbons to to, to to formulate correlation factors between odor and um, odor and uh, hydrocarbons, which in fact is but uh, must be know that there is no um, no causal uh, there's no uh, causal dependency between hydrocarbon emission. And, um, and odor emission. This is just a working tool to use a correlation factor. And as, as you have shown on the, in the table, in fact, this correlation factor too is temperature dependent. It's not surprising because the, I think the, the odorous substances have other evap evaporation rates, um, have different evaporation rates. 
is just a helping tool. Okay, thank you, Dr. Benton.